We are live. So welcome to January 29th, our webinar, Tai Chi, Exercise, and the Three Best Ways to Train the Brain. This is going to be so fun because we get to actually participate. And I, you know, sometimes in webinars, and, and it, I do this, you know, we, sometimes it's a PowerPoint, sometimes it's just information, which information is great. But to be able to participate today is really going to be fun. So I'm Diane Bailey. I'm the creator of the Open the Door to Tai Chi system. And obviously, we're going to be talking a little bit about Tai Chi, but my guest today is Denise Medved, the creator of Ageless Grace. And I first saw Denise uh, at the Functional Aging Summit a few years ago. And she was one of the keynote speakers and she had such energy and was so fun to listen to. And I loved what she was saying and what she was doing. It was, um, it, it was fascinating to me. So I got to meet her after she was spoke and uh, then fast forward a few months and I'm speaking at the International Council on Active Aging and so is Denise. And <laughs> She was so nice to me. Here we are in Florida, and she just took me under her wing like I was her best friend, and I, I so appreciated that because it was fun to be able to um, talk to people that are interested in actively aging and to present our material and to get to know everybody and to be able to help people. So I, Denise is a fascinating woman. She has a very interesting backstory, which I want her to describe to you. Um, things that happened in her own life that led her to this ageless grace creation. So Denise, I'm going to go ahead and let you tell your story and then we'll do, we'll figure out, we'll <laughs> figure out, we'll let everybody know what we feel is that are the three best ways to train your brain. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. Sounds great. So Quick backstory, I'm not gonna make it too long, but I was born with a, a mild form of spina bifida. Um, and even though mild, very painful, as I was in my teen years and my 20s and even into my early 30s. And along the way, I discovered that the thing that made me feel the best, the thing that took care of the pain most effectively was movement. And so I pretty much did everything I could possibly uh, get my hands on that might make my spine and my pain feel less, feel better, help my quality of life. I did Tai Chi, I did yoga, I did everything you can make trampolines I mean I did all kinds of things um, I became an Ania teacher instructor we'll talk a little bit more about that later and then ultimately I became a trainer for the Nia technique for 14 years and all of this has helped me not only be aware of health and fitness and what movement can do for the body and for the brain, but it's also made me stay really conscious of how we can be in charge of our own life quality, regardless of whatever diagnoses or experience or trauma or injury that we have. And so along the way, my mom, who was quite the intellect. She studied all the time. She took courses. She taught. She read two or three what I call real books every week. And she played the piano. And she did so many things that would be associated with good brain health and high functioning brain quality. This was before Harvard Medical School and many others since then determined that crossword puzzles, Sudoku, word games did not delay cognitive decline or necessarily help improve cognitive function because it affects only a part of the brain or one or two functions of the brain, not the entire brain. And I always like to liken that to brushing your teeth as people want to get a visual for it, that if you only brushed your front teeth for 20 years, I bet you'd have tooth problems. <laughs> because you're not taking care of the entire mouth and the entire teeth. Same thing with the brain. You could be brilliant, like my mother did the London Times and the New York Times crossword puzzles in ink and, and did them really quickly. But guess what? She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And that shook me to my core for several reasons. My dad, who was an artist and spoke English as a second language, 
was not a, a, a reader or a studier or a student. It was difficult for him, but he loved doing physical things. And so he decided that he could sculpt his own body and it became, I'm not kidding, a, not only a bodybuilder, but Mr. Tennessee, Mr. Wisconsin, Mr. Dixie. He was best back in abdominals in Mr. America and best back in abdominals in Mr. Universe. So here I had these two parents, one very active physically, one very active mentally. My mom did not exercise. She did not like it. It was not her thing. She always said, where did you come from, Denise? Because you're nothing like me. I must have gotten the wrong baby in the hospital. Um, so I had these two different role models to, to watch and observe. And my dad stayed strong and healthy and sharp as a tack until he died. My brilliant mother, who was always working on her brain, had Alzheimer's. So my question immediately was, wow, what, what could be the difference? And it can't be true that word games will help you with your cognitive function or my mom would be, you know, perfectly healthy. So long story short, it started me researching. And when I first began researching the word neuroplasticity, which we all know now, uh, which is the ability to change the brain and the central nervous system, was not even on the internet. It didn't exist. And of course, since then, I haven't checked in, in a couple of years, but since then, I have uh, Googled the word neuroplasticity, and there were something like 1.5 million references to neuroplasticity. So uh, it's become a, a, a very well-known subject and topic of the brain health. I started doing research, and over the course of seven years, really search for what could we do that would not only move the body, but affect the brain. And during that time, neuroscientists came up uh, with the conclusive evidence that the primary function of the brain is to control movement of the body. There you go, that tells us something. And that literally we can in fact affect our brains and change it regardless of our age. And that the best way to change it is through physical exercise. So not brain exercise, but physical exercise is the best exercise for the brain. So the topic today is really about what, uh, what is believed to be the three best ways to train the brain. And um, there are more than three ways, but they're the three things that I'm going to talk about today are clear ob objects that are tools that can help affect the brain as well as the body. You know, and, and what's fascinating, Denise, is that we're, we so often, especially in a Western culture, we like to separate things. You know, exercises for the body, there's something else for the brain. Or if, if you're a, an ear, nose, and throat doctor, then that's all you think about. Or if you're, a, you know, a urologist, that's all you think about. Whereas the body is really a whole unit and we need to be thinking about it as uh, what affects the body affects the brain as well. Yes. So that, that, that's where, why I wanted to bring you on because it's so interesting that it, it really is, it starts to bring us in as a whole, right? Yes. We, have, we have traditionally, until very recently, compartmentalized everything. As you said, medicine used to be the general doctor, the general practitioner that even came to your home and whatever was going on, that doctor would treat you. And now suddenly there's someone that, you know, does just the risk, nothing else, or someone who does, uh, works on knees and nothing else. Okay. You can look at the body in compartments. And the fact of the matter is, is it's not to be compartmentalized. We are one organism with many working parts, but we are one organism that includes the brain. Now the brain may be command central and it tells all those body parts how to work together to complete an activity or perform a function. But in fact, it is part of the body. So the old way of going home and doing crossword puzzles and then going out to the gym and working on uh, the treadmill for a certain amount of time and then coming home and reading a book is we found out that doesn't work. That is right. not what causes the brain to change to grow, to fire neurons, which are creating new brain cells, firing neurons. And so 
basically what it boils down to is the way we learned to develop our brains in the first place from the time we were born until late teens or early 20s was we actually played um and and what play meant was to experiment with doing different physical activities how can we learn to walk how can we throw a ball how do we jump rope how do we throw a frisbee how do we play on a team much more complex and now we're interacting with other people how do we mentally strategize analyze use our memory and experience be creative about the way we move learn through the body first how do we do all of those things we learned when we were a child even though we didn't have a name for it other than She's playing. playing. She's learning. Uh, she's yeah. having a good time. She's learning how to ride a bicycle. She's throwing a ball. But the reality was we were developing our brains. And so what happens when you get to be, uh, like I said, late teens or early 20s, is you tend to specialize. Once again, there's that word. You say, oh, I'm a good tennis player. What I do is play tennis. I play tennis five days a week. Well, that's wonderful. However, what you're doing is you're deepening the neural pathways that you've created by learning to play that game, but you're not necessarily firing anywhere near as many new neurons as when you were first starting to learn the game and you're saying, gosh, how do I hold a racket? Gosh, what do I do with my feet? Oh, oh serve? Like, how do I do that? So when you're learning something new, a new experience, you are really, uh, stimulating your brain and you're stimulating all those five primary functions of strategic planning, memory and recall, analytical thinking, creativity and imagination and learning. So, and that's the whole, that's the whole brain, just like brushing the whole teeth. <laughs> right. And, and that's where, when you created Ageless Grace, that's where you came up with SMAC, which yes. you just went through and those functions, those five functions of the brain and how do we get the, how do we get the brain and the body to be doing things? And it, um, you know, I'll, I will come back to smack in just a second, but um, just the novelty of doing something new is part of that, right? Absolutely. The, the novelty um, of the freshness of making your body coordinate with something where you have to plan, you have to figure out your, what are you doing? So um, I, I want you to go through those five things, smack again. Okay, so those five things, um, you will find them if you Google them. However, often you will find them described in different terms. Um, you know, it'll describe the process of strategic planning with the brain or the process of creativity and imagination. So it might have a different name applied to it, but we chose those ones we did because it was easy for people to remember that acronym S-M-A-C-K, which I liken to the sound of neurons firing, which is a <laughs> popping, cracking, smacking kind of sound uh, when that happens. Not that we can hear it, but that's, that's what they can pick up when they, listen to the sounds of neurons firing. So uh, when I talk about those five things, I'm talking about them in the context of the brain interacting with the body, in the context of movement. So you could have strategic planning where you sit at a desk and strategically plan exactly what you're going to do for your retirement. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about strategically planning with your brain how am I going to get from here downstairs? I, I happen to be upstairs in my house right now. How am I going to get from here downstairs to the front door if someone rings the doorbell? Now, obviously, we don't consciously think about that any longer. Right. However, the brain is scrambling, saying, doorbell, you need to get up. You need to get off the floor. You need to get off your chair. You need to go downstairs. You need to, uh, you know walk in a certain way, maybe you need to put your shoes on if you don't have them on. So the brain is strategically planning how to get from point A to B to C to D through the body, working with the brain. So the next one is memory and recall. And that, a lot of people talk about that as, the, as if that's the big thing with dementia, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, and that is a big component of it. And it's one of the more obvious when you start to notice that someone or yourself is not remembering things any longer. We tend to think that that's only a function of the brain, but believe it or not, memories are 
completely aligned with a physical experience. Even if that physical experience is the, the smell of strawberry soap in your Aunt Mary's house. That was a physical experience. Uh, and, but it was, has caused me to remember that that smell of strawberry soap is associated with Aunt Mary. So it is a physical experience. Almost every single thing that you think you remember, whether it's a fact you read in a geography book, a picture you saw in a magazine, sitting with a friend while they told you something that you remember, it's all a physical experience. So I'm talking about memory and recall from the point of physical experience. Now, recall is a little different from memory. Reason being, if I were to say to everybody listening, let's pretend that we're playing the trombone. Right away, most of us would immediately start using a slide, we'd hold it up to our mouth, and I bet most of us have never actually played a trombone. Right. <laughs> right. right. However, we have a recall of an experience, and that experience might be watching it on television, going to a concert, having a friend who played the trombone, it's a physical experience, memory and recall, one category. Next one is uh, analytical thinking. And again, you know, we all know what analytics are, you know, analyzing sheets of numbers or formulas or whatever. But analytical thinking from the point of view of the body and the brain is what are all my options? What are uh, all the possibilities of the way I could move or approach this or do this? And I often use as an example, a sport, for example, baseball, you could bat, you could catch, you could pitch, you could be a baseman, you could field, you could run, you could cheer from the stands. There are so many parts of that, that my brain sort of goes through almost like a Rolodex. Remember those? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Full of information. And like, oh, these are all the possibilities of this one activity. So that's analytical thinking from the physical point of view. The other thing is creativity and imagination. And most of us associate that with being a wonderful painter or an artist or a photographer or, or creating something, choreographing a dance piece. And that is true. However, look at it from the point of view how the brain and the body cooperate to do something creative. It's something a little out of the ordinary, something you don't always do. It's a creative way of doing. So yes, it is creative for me to paint a picture, especially if it's one I've never painted before. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also creative for me to say, hmm, I wonder what would happen if I brush my teeth with this hand instead of that hand. It's a new way of doing something, experimenting with moving differently. Kids do it all the time. There's that play again. You'll see a kid, oh, I remember my, my stepchildren saying things to me like, watch, I can hop on one foot, or watch me walk backwards, or uh, watch me throw the basket in the basketball hoop from over my shoulder. So many ways of creative moving. And once again, when we get to be late teens, early 20s, we stop experimenting so much for several reasons. We specialize in something that we're good at, or we're embarrassed to do something we don't look very uh, uh, coordinated doing, or we're shy about trying something new, there are so many reasons why it appeared that our brains stopped being changed because we stopped doing things that would really change them. Right. But so now more and more with the, with the things like saying 40 is the new 60 and our 60 is the new 40 and those types of things, we're seeing more and more people of, of more advanced years experimenting with new things. And they're saying, gee, I'm retired. Why don't I become a runner? Gee, I'm retired. I think I'm going to take ballroom dance classes. Gee, I've never done Tai Chi before. I think I'll try that. Right. So suddenly, more people are being willing to take a risk, a physical risk, of doing something that they haven't done before. And we're seeing change in the brains. 
uh, organiz uh, companies and magazines and webinars like Growing Boulder, for example, mm -hmm. they do a lot of interviewing and talking with people who, you know, at 75 ran their first marathon or uh, at uh, 68 they decided to paint for the first time in their lives and become an artist. Those are the kinds of things that we're seeing more and more and more because our quality of life is increasing to the place that we can actually feel good enough to try something new, especially something physical. Mm -hmm. There was a mindset, and it's still pretty prevalent, especially in maybe our parents' ages, the ones who birthed the baby boomers, of saying, okay, I'm 70, I'm old. Um, and, and I'm just going to, you know, that's what it is. I'm, I'm old. I'm, it's expected that I have arthritis. It's expected that I uh, slow down. It's expected that I sit in my chair and watch a lot of TV. But the baby boomer generation and younger is saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go out and try something new. And so we're seeing much greater change in the brains now than we have before because we're not necessarily accepting the old paradigm of what does aging look like. Right. That's good. Yeah. Well, and, and with the smack, right. Right, with the five pieces and putting that all together into ageless grace, I mean, what, when, you know, when we, talked about this webinar we told people what are the three best ways to train the brain right so you know give us a little bit more about that denise okay uh, by the way i didn't finish the k the smack i know <laughs> the k is kinesthetic learning and you all probably know what that is it's learning through the body first and then the brain observes what the body's doing and helps you become more efficient at that so a good example would be you know we didn't take a course or uh, have an instructor teach us how to throw a ball probably when right. we were two or three or four years old we just watched our siblings or our parents or somebody and we said hmm, I think I'll try that so that's bicycle it's, you know I mean I don't think most of us took a class on how to ride a bicycle, we just <laughs> tried it. Um, and so that's kinesthetic learning. And, and that's very important to stimulating the brain because the minute you try something, immediately the brain says, oh, I want to be part of that. Uh, right. Let me let me give you some guidance. Uh, right. If you do that again, I think I can help you do it better. So then suddenly you're causing this dialogue between the brain and the body and that's kinesthetic learning. So back to that, those three best ways. Um, there have been many articles written, and I, for those of you who are on online or watching this uh, later, Dr. Cody Sipe, uh, who's one of the co-founders of Functional Aging Institute, FAI, uh, wrote an article, oh, I don't know, maybe a year ago, I'm not sure of the exact date, but in ARP magazine, and talked about three of the three great ways to really be able to change your brain. And so not to keep it a secret, one is Tai Chi, Yes. One, yeah, yeah. Uh, one is dance, but it's not just any kind of dance. It's it's dance where you are learning the steps to the dance. Okay. The ballroom dancing, the Nia fitness technique that I mentioned earlier. Yes. There's two moves or steps or movements in that program. Um, and then one was Ageless Grace. And Ageless Grace doesn't have the corner on the market of of helping your brain. However, it's been put together specifically from lots of different disciplines and backgrounds. We even have one called Tai Chi, uh, mm -hmm. which is an imitation of Tai Chi. And we have one called uh, Dance Party, which is an imitation of ballroom dancing and other dances that have steps. But it comes from lots of sources. And each one of the 21 exercises is designed to stimulate and activate those five primary functions of the brain so that you're not just imitating movements, you're actually creating them in coordination with your brain. You're coming up with ideas for how to do the movements and you're focused, you're attentive, you're noticing what you're doing, you're being mindful of what you're doing. And I'm sure that most people listening to this uh, webinar know that there have been hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands of articles written on how mindful activities where you must pay attention, be aware, be conscious of each movement make a much bigger difference in the physical benefit you get from it on a cellular level and from the mental 
benefit that you get from it. Also That's, emotional. It, it's amazing to me that there's still people that, you know, they say, I just want to go and, and be mindless and get on the treadmill. And, you know, while that might be good, you may actually be doing some cardiovascular good, right? But you're, you could be doing so much more. And that's part of this, um, the three best ways to train your brain is they all have this similarity of you have to actually be in the moment. You have to be thinking. You have to be noticing and responding and reacting. I mean, you, you talk about the three R's a lot and it's not reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> right, go, go ahead with those three R's. What, what are those? It's respond, react, and recover. And interestingly enough, those are three skills that we need to acquire in order to have optimal lifelong function. The first one, really simple, responding to whatever you need to do physically or want to do and mentally. Like if I, do I want to get up and walk across the room? Do I need to get up and walk across the room? So can I respond to those things that I need to do physically? And of course that engages the brain and mentally. The second one is react. Because we all know that sometimes things happen that are a little unexpected. You know, we trip over something. We round the corner and someone else is coming around the corner. We um, find out that the door is closed and we're going to have to go down the stairs. I mean, there's always something a little unexpected. And that's the reacting part. Can your body and your brain react quickly enough so that you're able to adjust to what you need or want to do? Mm -hmm. um, the last one is recover because sometimes we don't respond quickly enough or react quickly enough or we literally had no warning. There was no time to respond or react. So we're going to have to recover. You know, mm -hmm. something blindsided us, something uh, happened and we had no idea that it was going to happen. So again, are your brain and body trained to be able to adjust to something so surprising that if you don't recover from that, you're going to hurt yourself or hurt someone else? Uh, a great example, of course, is driving a car. How quickly can you respond, react, and recover when you're driving a car? And those who can do that really quickly probably have never had a car accident. Right. Um, but those who, who, who haven't been able to. So the, the good news about Respond, React, and Recover is you can practice it without putting yourself in danger. You know, uh, you don't have to actually fall on the floor and get back up a thousand times to, to train yourself to respond or recover to something. But what you can do is respond, react, and recover to other things. And that's some of the things that we put into Ageless Grace is can I do something unexpected uh, and be able to do it fairly quickly? And the more I practice doing that, the more my brain's going to be able to do it next time I'm on a staircase and I slip. Um, and it will be able to say, oh, I, I know how to respond, react, and recover. I can do that. So it's an important thing. So all 21 of these tools that we do in Ageless Grace, again, we're mindfully put together to cause you to be better at responding, reacting, and recovering. And I want to try some Ageless Grace now. That we're, we're going to do a little bit of Tai Chi as well, but I want, to, I want to have the audience experience some Ageless Grace so that they can see how they have to be mindful, they have to be in the moment, they have to respond, they have to react. And, and it is fun. Both my husband and I are Ageless Grace. We got certified in Ageless Grace, and it really is fun. So I, I want the audience to experience it. So let's do some, Denise. Sure. Um, just a quick thing about the fun part of it. Again, it's based on play. It's experimenting and playing, taking risks, doing something that you may not be good at. As a matter of fact, you may not even be able to do it. So I prepare you right now that a couple of the things I'm going to show you, you may be thinking like, what is wrong with me? I'm not able to do that. Well, there's nothing wrong with you. That's the whole idea. The important part when you're practicing any of these tools is to not stop or give up or say to yourself, oh, I can't do that. I'm not even going to try. Because if you do that, you're not affecting your brain. The way you're affecting the brain is by attempting uh, to do it. You probably never met a child who said, oh, I'm just not going to walk because I tried it once and I fell down. <laughs> you know, they, they, they just keep trying. They keep you trying. Don't try. you don't, there's, there are not many children. There may be some, but there are not many children who said, gee, I got on the bicycle, fell off, not doing that again. They just mm -hmm. keep trying. So that's what 
this is about is do your best to do it and laugh at yourself just like you would if you were a child right. <laughs> so I have to get up and sit in this chair over here because you need to see my feet uh, but before I go over there I want to explain to you why I'm doing this sitting uh, because a lot of people say like oh it's seated uh, that's for old people uh, I'm you know I'm not ready for that yet I'm, I'm very healthy and active I climb mountains I do triathlons I'm not ready for anything seated number one reason is because all the things that we do in this program either require that you be seated because you're going to use both feet and I don't know many people who can have both feet off the ground at the same time uh, without a chair so the second thing is that that in a chair we are literally having to scramble mentally to say well how she's saying let's pretend we're playing basketball how do you do that in a chair uh, or let's pretend we're swimming how do you do that in a chair what do you do with your feet so the whole idea of being in a chair is that instantaneously whatever I'm going to ask you to do your brain is saying okay let's figure out how to do that seated because the only rule is don't get out of your chair <laughs> right there so if you're not seated while you're listening to this uh, some I know I stand up and work at my computer for example um, so if you're not seated find a seat I'm going to go find one and and know that the reason we're being seated is to activate and stimulate the brain not only immediately but through the entire process of doing these exercises and remember that whole novel experience thing because um, as you're seated like you said you don't play basketball seated usually um, you don't do these things usually from a chair so again it's that whole uh, experiencing something novel and making your brain put together how am I going to do this so go ahead Denise I'm gonna I'm gonna participate as well oh good excellent so I scoot back so you can see my feet when they move um, a little bit uh, there are 21 different tools we're not going to do all 21 or we'd be here for several hours uh, but I'm going to show you just a few of them so one of the ones that I think is fun and we've already kind of talked about it is something called team fit and it's the idea of playing as many different sports as you can imitating that you're playing that sport we all do this to music and we do it barefoot uh, and that's because there are 7,000 nerve endings in each foot and that is part of the central nervous system the brain the central nervous system the nerves throughout the body the spinal cord so we're stimulating that in a safe way because there's no real impact or weight bearing involved in this but the feet are bare or in socks in order to stimulate those 14,000 nerve endings that are just in the feet uh, so Team Fit is always done to music, all 21 tools, and the reason is music is one more layer of stimulating the brain. Again, thousands, tens of thousands of research papers on how music affects the brain. So we're not gonna use music today. I'm just gonna show you some of the exercises. So the first one, let's do Team Fit, and I'm just gonna think of as many as I can uh, in a short amount of time, and that's what we're gonna do. So I already mentioned uh, how would you play basketball. So let's dribble the basketball and you're dribbling and if you are a basketball player great because now you've got to figure out how to do this seated and let's pretend we're really good so I'm going to dribble under my leg and around <laughs> the side with the opposite hand and over here and back and I'm doing basketball uh, today in honor of Kobe Bryant right and uh, his daughter so let's do this whole thing now let's pretend it's time to shoot so let's shoot from the chair but you can't really get out of the chair you just got to shoot now there's all different kinds of techniques for that right you might go from the chest overhand. <laughs> there are some of you might do it this way between the legs so we're playing with the idea how do I do this we can pass it off to someone uh, someone might pass it to us and we catch it then we can switch and do a different sport. Let's do baseball because I mentioned it. Let's bat. Let's be batters. Batter up. And you're sort of sizing it up. You're not really hitting the ball yet. You're just feeling the bat in your hand, getting your swing ready. And then you're going to hit it out of the ballpark. And you know what happens when you hit it. You're going to run. Run, 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 run. And you might be rounding the bases. First, second, third. Oh, I think we're going to have to slide in home. How would you do that? Whoa. And then you might be the pitcher. Let's wind up and pitch and let's be a lefty pitcher. Whoa. <laughs> and pitch with the left hand. And if you're right-handed or if you're left-handed already, then maybe you want to pitch with your right hand. 
or we can sort of be ambidextrous and try it on both sides. So another sport might be swimming. Now, I don't know about you, but I have to sit back in my chair and put my feet out in front of me because I can't get them behind me in a chair. Uh, so here I am swimming and let's do uh, the crawl. And of course, you know, there are lots of different strokes that you could do uh, to swim. We could do a side stroke. We could do a breast stroke. We could do a backstroke. <laughs> Let's do the side stroke to the other side. <laughs> we could dive, put one foot down and dive. And that foot forward and down is to support your head and chest as you're diving down. So that would be team fit. And I don't know about you, but I can feel my heart rate. Um, I have, I feel very, like I have definitely done a little workout, even though that was only, you know, three or four minutes at the most. And so then we would switch after the length of one song and do something else, something different. Um, I'm just checking in, Diane, can you still hear and see me? Cause I, I did, I just took myself off the screen because I want people to be able to see you better. Okay. Uh, they don't need to see me looking silly. Okay. <laughs> just check that everything was fine. So that was called Team Fit. Obviously there are hundreds of sports and physical activities you could do that ideally every time you were to practice this tool, you'd do something different. You'd say, oh, we could ride the bicycle. We could do a whole triathlon to the length of a song. We could swim, ride a bike and run. Uh, there are so many things that you could do for this. And the idea is to put your brain into switching from one thing to the next and to do it differently each time that you do it. Um, so that is a, a, was an easy, fun one to do called Team Fit. Now here's one of my favorites, it's called Gentle Geometry. And it's all about three shapes from geometry, triangles, lines, and circles. So start off, and again, don't stop, even if you think you can't do it. Let's try a triangle with one hand. And you're just shaping the triangle in the air. And then you're gonna take the opposite foot and draw a circle. Uh-oh! Uh, so you might or might not be able to do this at all. You might be fairly good at it. If you feel like you're trying to do it and can't quite get it, keep practicing. And if you feel like I kind of sort of got it, then add a horizontal line and I'm hoping to get you to the place that you absolutely can't do this without being completely focused on what you're doing. And even then it's like, what? Triangle with my hand? horizontal line with my other hand, circle with my foot, and you just keep practicing, trying to put those shapes and forms together. Now, we would do this for a while, because again, we're doing it to the length of one song, but we would switch somewhere in there and do just the mirror opposite. So this hand starts doing the triangle, this foot starts doing the circle. I'm not as good on this side. And if you can't do it, great, keep trying. And if you sort of kind of got it, add that horizontal line. So you've got a triangle with your left hand or your opposite hand. The opposite foot has a circle. Your other hand is drawing a horizontal line. And I don't know about you, but I can totally feel my brain sort of scrunching up and saying, what, are, what is it we're doing? Like, oh my gosh, how do we do this? So again, you would keep that up for the length of a song, which is usually only about three or four minutes. Um, and so I, I just wanted to interject, Denise. I, I think that, you know, as people experience, especially that one, I love that one because it is so difficult. I, you know, you start with a triangle and then you start a circle and your hand starts circling too, right? Just, but the beauty of it is that you're not, perfection is not expected. It's that trying, it's the doing. And I just did a webinar just a couple weeks ago talking about perfection is not the goal. That's it's right. getting the benefits of Tai Chi. It's not 
for you to be a world-class Tai Chi person. It's for you to get the benefits. And one of the benefits is mental acuity, right? Executive functioning. That's, and so I love that that translates where it doesn't matter what you're doing. It matters that you're trying. So yeah. let's, let's do one more. I love this. Um, so there, this is, there's, there's a few that I'm going to give you the names of we're not going to actually do because the idea is really simple. One's called Front Row Orchestra, and it's literally like how many different musical instruments can you remember and imagine to play during the length of any song, any kind of music, whatever you like, and can you switch from one instrument to the next? Can you play it with the right hand and the left hand? That type of thing. We have one called Balancing Act, and it's all about the three major balance points of the body. Uh, the balance point in the center of the ball of the foot and practicing landing on the ball of the foot. The balance point that's the center point uh, of, the, of the body or the center of gravity. That is also called the Har or the Dong Chen in many martial arts, for example. Uh, and how do we organize our bodies, uh, our arms, our legs, our head, our shoulders around that center point? And then the last one is the canals of the ear and how do we move the head to get the fluid uh, and the, the little tiny particles of bone uh, in that fluid to move so that we're improving our balance while we're sitting down in a safe position. So I could go through all 21 tools like that and I'm not going to, but the next one that I wanna show you, uh, which is really kind of fun, is uh, called Body Math. And it's about tapping your foot, tapping your hand, and clapping and counting at the same time. Uh, so we're gonna count from one to eight on each side right now. I'm gonna show you the simplest version of this, but it can get very complicated. Uh, so we're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now clap on four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Clap on seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, four, and seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there are many ways to do this. You can count backwards on one side, forwards on the other. You can count from one to five on one side and finish six, seven, eight on the other side, or one to three and finish four, five, six, seven, eight on the other side. But the point is to really, this is a great one for respond, react, and recover because you're changing what you're doing very frequently so that each time you get a little mixed up or your brain is saying, what, we're not clapping on seven anymore? We're clapping on three. Oh, we're clapping on five and seven. Oh, we're counting backwards so that you are training your brain to such an extent that it's responding quickly with the body and the body's responding quickly with the brain. It's a wonderful fall prevention exercise. Uh, so I'm gonna show you what I meant by counting uh, to a certain number. We use eights and fours because that's what most music is. Because again, remember you're doing this to music and not only does it stimulate the brain, but it's also giving you a beat or a rhythm to follow. It can be slow. It could be very fast, it could be somewhere in between. So I'm gonna choose a moderate speed right now and I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five. Now I'm gonna go to six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you get the idea that you're switching and counting and tapping and keeping up with the music. And you are literally training your brain to respond, react, and recover to what it is that you want it to tell your body to do. And you're teaching your body to respond to that. It gets to be hysterically funny when you're in a class of people doing that and you've got 30 or 40 people and they're all trying to clap and tap and, uh, uh, and do their best. So again, it's not the pursuit of perfection. It's actually the pursuit of fun and taking a risk and trying something new. And, you know, that's, that's a, it, it is hysterically funny when you get a whole group of people. <laughs> and it, 
the the whole idea of being mindful, you know, coming back to that secret ingredient, which is really you you have to be in the moment. You have to be right here and thinking about, am I clapping on seven or am I clapping on four? Is my foot moving? Am I drawing a triangle? All of these things, you have to be mindful and it's connected to a physical exercise. So that's the real key of training the brain of it is something where you have to actually uh, be thinking about what movements you're doing. And back to what you that a lot of people say, oh, I just like to go to the gym, get on the treadmill, put on my earphones, I don't want to think. That means that they probably haven't experienced mindful exercise before because I don't know about anyone else, but there's no way I could do the things I was just doing and be thinking about anything else. Like I'm not worried about what my boss said at work. I'm not thinking about what I'm gonna have for dinner. I'm not worried that my kid's making a C instead of a B in school. I'm right there saying, is it the seven or is it the four? And <laughs> am I playing basketball or am I playing baseball? What am I doing here? So to me, it's very relaxing to participate. It does shut my mind off. Yes. everything else what I'm doing right now and that's why it's called mindful exercise uh, because it is it is mindful about what you are doing at that moment it's not about being aware of all the other things in your life so to me it's very relaxing more so than just doing a physical exercise repetitively and not and not thinking about what I'm doing um, so it, it can be very, very relaxing and shut out the whole rest of the day to actually be mindful of what it is you're doing in the moment. And the same thing applies to Tai Chi as well. And if everybody, if you want to stand up and try, I'm going to stand back just a little bit. And now I know you can't see my feet, but that's okay. What the same thing applies of being mindful, not only of where are my feet, what am I doing, where, where are my hands, what am I doing with my body, but what is the next movement, where am I going with this, and then adding how do I add the principles of you were talking about moving from the Dantian and how that affects with balance. How do I breathe with this movement? You have to add these layers of thought on when you're doing Tai Chi. So even though it's not as fast paced as maybe Ageless Grace, maybe we don't use music as much in Tai Chi, but you still have to be thinking about, am I balanced? What's my next move? How am I coordinating my body? How can I add the breathing? So there's lots of mindful activity going on. So I want you to try one. We did this last time at the um, webinar last week, but this is called Wave Hands Like Clouds. So I want you to take, if you're mirroring me or if I'm mirroring you, you're, this would be your left hand and you're gonna be drawing a counterclockwise circle, just like this. And now I want you to bring that one down. I want you to bring your other hand, which this would be your right hand, and you're gonna draw a clockwise circle. And now I want you to start rotating from the body as well. So you're not just moving your arms, you're actually making that circle with your body. And now you have to start using both hands. So as this hand comes down, the other one comes across and you're coordinating that movement. I want you to think about rotating on a central column. So you're not dipping your shoulders like this. You're keeping yourself in a good posture. And now I want you to bring all your weight over to one side and lift that other leg, and then bring your weight to the other side and lift. So now you're having to think about where is my weight? Am I rotating properly? Am I staying balanced? And now breathing in here 
and then breathing out with the other hand. Breathing in and breathing out. So with just that simple movement, wave hands like clouds, now all of a sudden, were you able to think about your grocery list? No. <laughs> you were moving, you were thinking about being balanced. In Tai Chi, we talk about insubstantial and substantial. That's a huge part of balance. If you simply think about bringing all your weight over to one side and lifting one leg, this side is substantial, this leg is insubstantial. Bringing it over to the other side. That's a simple way, but then when you start adding actual movement and having to think about moving from side to side, keeping that substantial and insubstantial, keeping the rotation going, all of this is a lot to be thinking about, but that's good, right? And Denise, I love that you're sitting because Tai Chi can be modified for sitting and you're still getting the benefits of it even from that seated position as long as you're applying the underlying principles. If you're just sitting and moving your hands in the air and thinking about your grocery list, you're not getting the benefits, right? Part of learning Tai Chi, once, you know, some people approach me and they say, well, once I've learned all 24 movements, I'm done, right? I'm like, no, because you have to apply those underlying principles. But there's also a novelty, which we've talked about a lot in here, of you can mix things up. Yes, there is a sequence to the form. Yes, we do the form usually in that sequence. But that doesn't mean we have to always follow that same sequence. I can make sure that my students are having a novel brain experience by asking them to do things on the opposite side of their body. For example, deflect, intercept, and punch. If you take this hand and just bring it up like this, and take your other hand and face the palm out. So one palm is in, the other palm is out. Now bring them down to your hip and bring it up and do, the, uh, do that same thing, but do it together. Now I want you to bring this fisted hand to your waist, Leave this other hand here and then punch out. Okay, good. That's deflect, intercept, and punch. Let's do it again. You're going to bring your hands down to your hip. Bring it up. One hand is pointed in, one hand's pointed out. Bring the fisted hand to your waist and then punch. Now, I know that might be novel to you already, but you have to do it on the other side of your body. So now bring it over here and bring both hands up. Remember the fisted palm is facing towards your face and the other is facing out. Now bring that fisted hand in and punch out. Good, so if you were to have to do that on both sides of your body and go back and forth, now I can do that fairly easily, but if you're new to that, that's a novel experience, that's great for your brain as well. So I wanted to show you some of the Tai Chi. Yeah, you can come back, Denise. That'd be great. Um, and we do have um, uh, with dance, right? We were talking about dance earlier. It's not, um, that's one of the three best exercises because you have to be mindful, especially if you're the woman. <laughs> We were joking, say, because she does everything backwards and in high heels, right? <laughs> Already dancing, anyway. And, and we have to respond, we have to react, and we have to recover sometimes. Um, <laughs> but that's part of why dance is so good, because you, you have to be physically responding and thinking of, how do I do this? He's asking me to turn, right? And if you are the man, you have to be planning, you have to be saying I need to be moving around the floor in a coordinated fashion and not push my partner into the next people, right? Yeah. So it's, it's very, uh, the dance, the steps, which part of that is Tai Chi, you know, um, ageless grace with, there are the, just the varying tools and the different things that you have to respond to 
and the fun part of it, right? And so, so you've got your three best exercises. You've got your dance, ageless grace, and then Tai Chi, where you can see that that one ingredient going through is really being mindful in all of the movement, where your brain is actually connected to what am I doing? How, how can I coordinate this movement? How can I be my best at this movement? It's not just put one foot in front of the other. Exactly. Does that make sense? Um, you know, um, Absolutely. We, Diane and I talked a little earlier about the idea that there are all kinds of forms of dancing, needless to say, and some don't really require for you to pay attention to what you're doing. Uh, you could be just moving around and dancing to the music. You should be, you could be watching someone else do it and just imitating them, but you're not really thinking about what you're doing or trying to learn the steps. The dance that, that, has been researched and has become one of the best things you can do to train your brain. The one that Dr. Seip, Cody, was talking about in his paper is ballroom dancing, dancing with different kinds of steps. That's why I mentioned Nia earlier. There are 52 moves. Fairly quickly, you need to learn from your teacher. You are watching your teacher, but you need to learn pretty quickly. What are those 52 moves? What is it that I'm going to do? What's When we start to go to the right, what's the move going to be? When we start to kick, how do I kick? All those different types of things. So when you're actually learning steps or learning a pattern or learning a combination of moves, that is the most effective brain exercise. And yes, it could be hip hop. There is a there's there are real things that you do in hip hop that are real steps that are real moves. It could be um, uh, salsa, Mine. Latin dancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. I mean, there are so many different kinds of dancing. Oh, wonderful Celtic dancing. Oh yeah, yeah. not that one for a while. Clogging. I took a clogging class, and I think I need to take it for a few more years. Uh, <laughs> it was fabulous, and it was fascinating. And I, who dance all the time, and have had lots of dance training was amazed at how my brain was just so focused on like what happened there oh it was a heel toe heel oh what's going on that is exactly the kind of thing you want to do that is engaging your brain at the same time so tai chi dance ageless grace and things like ageless grace that cause you to specifically activate the brain as well as the body doesn't mean these other things are bad you know being on a treadmill is wonderful for your heart and certain sure. muscle groups there's nothing wrong with that but if one of your goals is to stimulate your brain and train it uh, then then these are the kinds of things that that you want to do or have your clients do if you work with clients uh, we had a couple of people um popping up with comments of um line dancing yes you know, those are movements Excellent. and and belly dancing yes um, i've never done belly dancing i'm right. sure that that, that would be something so novel and there are movements that I would have to, and actually connect with how I'm moving. So yes, absolutely. Um, Hawaiian dancing. Tell you're telling a story at the same time that you're dancing. Wonderful for the brain. And again, now when you get really good at one of these things, it doesn't mean it's not good for you, but it's not nearly as good as you saying, "Gee, I'm I'm pretty good at hip hop. I think I'm going to try salsa and see how I do at that." That's the idea: is to change it up. Uh, so that your brain is is learning something new and firing neurons uh, right. rapidly as possible. And so. that's part of, even though when people ask learning Tai Chi, am I done at that There's time? Better. And it's no, you're not, because there are so many more things to apply to what you're learning in that movement. So it's not just the same thing all the time. Absolutely. Um, one of the participants asked um, earlier when you were doing your ageless grace and you were talking about balance um, she was asking about how the being seated I'm, I'm assuming this is her question because she she had just uh, and Donna let me know if this is correct um, you just said balance question mark um, and and that is something that people say you know well if you're seated what how do you get balance out of that do you want to address that yes 
Um, so the particular one that we use in the 21 tools is called Balancing Act. And we focus on the three primary balance points of the body, which a lot of people don't even realize there are three primary balance points. Um, a lot of people just go straight to the, to the let's balance issue as opposed to what helps us be able to balance. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things that have to do with balance, uh, agility, mobility, stability, strength, flexibility, all those hate things have something to do with balance. So obviously all the 21 things we're doing in ageless grace and many other forms of movement are, are helping with balance. But specifically we work with the balance point of the foot, which is in the center of the ball of the foot on each foot. And that's true whether you're being with your feet flat on the ground, the center point is still the center of the ball of the foot, or whether you're lifting your heels off the floor like to reach up and put something on the shelf then it's real clear and obvious that you are on the center of the ball of the foot so we do this seated because you have a prop to hold on to you have your chair you can hold on to the arms of the chair the sides of the chair and you're practicing walking in place or around your chair on the ball of the foot pressing the weight into the ball of the foot, moving in different patterns, using the weight on the ball of the foot, all different kinds of things like that. Because quite frankly, a lot of people who are ready, quote, quote, to learn about balance, it's already a little late. Like they've noticed that they don't have good balance. So what can I do to help fix it? So they're not necessarily ready to do some of the more traditional balance uh, training things that we might do uh, in a gym or in a one-on-one -on -one personal training, for example. The second one, then, it's that Hara or Don Chin. Tons of people don't even know they have a center point or a, a point of uh, their, their gravity point, or they certainly don't know there's a Hara or a Don Chin or some name for it. And so they don't know that it's in the center of their body, about two inches below uh, the belly button, but inside you, in the middle of you. So again, Yes, those of you who are physically fit and fairly strong could stand up and play with being on and off balance in the air, being on one foot at a time, shifting weight. But for most people, that's a challenge right away. So we're in a chair and we're doing the same thing. We're literally floating, moving around, reaching down and touching the floor with one hand, lifting one leg up or even both because you can do that in a chair and playing with the whole idea of being on and off balance because that does not not only does that help all of your extremities be able to connect to and organize themselves around the balance point or the center of gravity, but it also helps you with your fear because that's a big part of balance. Certainly at a certain age, a lot of people start to think, oh my gosh, I tripped the other day. Oh, I hope I don't fall and break my hip. So then they're afraid to do a lot of things standing that we can do in a chair and they're not afraid to try it. I see people who can sometimes barely walk into the room sitting in their chair and doing what I was just doing with their legs in the air and their arms down. I'm saying, yes, how awesome. Cause they're partly not only getting physically adept at organizing themselves around the center point of the body, but they're getting emotionally adept at saying, Hey, I can do this. I don't have to be so afraid. And then the other balance point is uh, the three canals of the ear, which of course have fluid in them. And they have little crystals that go back and forth in the fluid, uh, much like ballast in a ship. However, when you, as you age, it's been proven that you move your head less and less and less. You tend to move your body, not your head. So for various reasons, uh, one of those is fear of falling. So people will actually turn their whole body around to look behind them instead of just turning their head. So we get them seated because they could get dizzy uh, to move their head as much as possible in different directions. And we give them cues and ideas of things to do that will cause them to move their head so that they're not actually focused on, gee, I'm moving my head. They're focused on the idea of saying, yes, enthusiastically, like a, like a five-year-old would if you ask if they want to go to Disney World, or they're <laughs> focused on looking at the fly that's buzzing around the room and moving their head. They're doing things that cause them to move that head, because what happens when you move your head less and less is that fluid in the ear, which needs to be liquid, that's why it's called fluid, um, 
become thick and gooey. And then the little crystals get stuck in the fluid. And so things happen like uh, being off balance or being dizzy when you move your head or even having vertigo. Um, so the idea of being able to move the head and get that fluid and those little crystals or particles of bones to move inside the fluid is very important to overall balance. So those are the three things we focus on. And all of those we do, uh, my, my sheepdog just walked into the room. Come up here, Jackson, say hello. There's dad. Well, I and, have and very, a very good balance. <laughs> well, and part of understanding balance too is it's a use it or lose it kind of thing. You have to practice it. And, and one of the comments, Susan, she says, I'm 73 and I always put my pants and socks on without sitting down, standing on one foot. That's awesome. You know, you're, you're working at it. There are people that are not in that place, so they need to be working more. Um, there's a, lot, a lot of people are very fearful of practicing balance. Absolutely. Uh, so what this gives you with the chair is, is literally, as I mentioned earlier, it's a prop. It's something to hold on to. It's something most people aren't afraid of falling out of a chair. Right. Uh, uh, so, so we can get them to do a lot of things that will help their balance in a chair that we couldn't get them to do if they were standing. We have another question. Um, how can ageless grace or mindful exercise be incorporated in a community health center in integrated behavioral health program? Um, I, I'm assuming the question is, you know, how can we incorporate it into a community health center um, in, and integrate it with behavioral health programs? Um, go ahead with ageless grace, Denise. Well, ageless grace, is designed to be really one of two things, well, three things actually. One is a class. It's a group situation where there is a person who's been trained and certified as an ageless grace educator. We have 3,000 of them and every weekend or week we have more added to that. And so there could be a facilitator or a person who's certified to facilitate the group. And it's a class and it's, as Diane mentioned earlier, everybody's laughing, everybody's having a good time, uh, everybody is, is willing to play play, uh, and especially when they find out it's going to help their brain. The other one is it's a wonderful one-on-one -on -one tool. If you're working with a client or a patient that says, uh, gee, I have balance issues, or gee, I have memory issues, or I have uh, uh, some shoulder problems, you can use Ageless Grace in a one-on-one, -on -one and you can do certain tools with them that would specifically help that challenge or issue. You can assign them homework. These are the two or three that I'd like you to practice until we meet again next time. That's a wonderful one-on-one -on -one tool. And then the last one is it's a personal practice. It's actually been designed to be done 10 minutes a day, every day. That would be in a perfect world. Now I do that, but then I'm the creator and founder. So of course I do. Um, but a lot of people do. And here's why. Because when you're doing something that stimulates your brain, it only lasts so long. And that is very genetic. How long does my brain stay stimulated before it starts to need more stimulation? Which means it's starting to or remain the same at the very best, but usually it's a big time. So if I do only 10 or 15 minutes of this every morning, I'm, I'm maintaining and possibly even improving the function of my brain because I just keep doing it. I keep doing it every day. They've actually done studies that show if you're going to do brain exercises that are physically related, it's better to do 10 minutes a day than it is to do 70 minutes on Friday afternoon. And you think, oh, wow, I can do 70 minutes of brain exercise once a week and I can get all this benefit, except it's going to start to decline the benefit until you do it the next time. So what's great about this also is that it's designed to be done in short pieces. You can do three tools at four minutes each and you've done 12 minutes and you're finished for the day and then you do it again the next day. And again, as I mentioned earlier, ideally you do it differently, even if you're repeating the same tools. So one is called spelling bee. We didn't do that one, but you spell words. You spell a letter with your nose. You spell another letter with your elbow. You spell another letter with your knee. Uh, you spell a letter with your back. And and so, needless to say, there are millions of words, and you could even spell in different languages. Uh, you can spell in Arabic, which is a, a which is a, an alpha 
language as opposed to a numerical uh, language. I mean, there's a symbolic language as opposed to alphanumeric. So there's so many different ways that you can use some of these tools. And so what I wouldn't do is spell the same word every day. Or if I did this four times a week, I wouldn't spell the same word every time I do a different word so that my brain's like, oh, how do I make that letter? Or how do I write that word in cursive with my elbow? Or how about if can I write it backwards in cursive with this other elbow? Uh, so there are so many things that you're doing that make it different every time you do it. Again, no more better illustration than to say this is not about perfection, not even right. close. Right. It's about playing with doing something that you don't normally do in a new and different way from the way you've ever done it before, if you've even ever done it before. And the same thing goes with dance and with Tai Chi in that, you know, dance, you're not going to be doing the exact same steps all the time in the exact same order. In Tai Chi, it's such a gentle form of exercise. You can do it every day and you can focus on a different principle every day. You know, today I'm going to be working on my breathing. Um, I, it, there's all kinds of different ways to be working on the body and working on the brain at the same time. Um, well, the nice thing about your, your open the door to Tai Chi too, is that you do teach it in pieces, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so you learn this movement and then you put that together with another movement. I mean, I could, I could practice what we just did like for days. Yeah. Uh, how nice that I have options. And I say, well, now I'm going to practice this next part. Well, now I'm going to practice putting these two parts together. Right. Um, like you say that it's a, it mindful movement tends to be called a practice. Right. Yes. That's what it is. It's a practice. So Ageless Grace is called a practice. We're going to practice the tools. We're going to practice 10 minutes a day. We're going to go to a class and practice for an hour. Um, it's, it, it's ballroom dance is practice. Like let's go and practice. Even in your, in, if you've got a dance teacher, right away, they're going to say, this is the move we're going to practice tonight. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, yes. it's practicing. It's not accomplishing or anything. <laughs> it's practicing. Right. And and to go back to that question about, you know, incorporating it into a community program, I, Tai Chi is something that you can teach classes, you can open the door, certifies people to teach. Ageless Grace certifies people to do Ageless Grace. One of the questions is, how do I become a trained facilitator in Ageless Grace? Um, I, I want you to be able to share your information so that people can get more information from sure. you. Um, there is, um, uh, we have a website, agelessgrace.com, and there's tons of information on there that you can use. There are, there are blog articles on just about everything you can imagine because Ageless Grace is being used with Parkinson's groups and Alzheimer's groups and breast cancer survivor groups and very healthy, active uh, groups of people that ride bikes every week. Uh, it's being used in a lot of places, so there are blog articles. There are some handouts and there are some uh, things that you can get that you can sign up for and it's a free free download that you can get um, there's a section at the top that says training and a drop down box is schedule and you can go to that and it will show you where there are ageless grace trainings happening all over the world literally as i mentioned early on we're in 29 countries and all 50 states so there are trainings happening all the time and i'm sure there's probably one near you or you can choose to travel to do it it's two days of training it's 14 hours uh, it is a nationally or internationally accredited program it is accredited with silver sneakers Silver and Fit, Renew Active. I mean, there are so many ways you can use this. And that refers back to um, a, a setting where you could use it uh, in, in, in an integrated way with different uh, groups and organizations. It's being taught in support groups. It's being taught by guidance counselors. It's being taught by uh, psychologists and therapists. So many different people can use this so many different ways and apply it to what they're doing. And we even have have tools that are what I would call store, they're adaptable to curriculum. We have a lot of school teachers all over the world teaching Ageless Grace in their classrooms and they do one tool maybe every hour 
and they tie it into curriculum. So body math might be something they would do with the tapping and counting before math. Spelling, their spelling words could be before they study their words for the week or their English. Um, there's one called zoology, which is all different kinds of moving by like different animals. And that could be for geography, like let's do all the different animals you might find in Montana. Yeah. So needless to say, you can use a lot of these things to incorporate it into your specific group. Are you leading a support group? Are you working at a senior center? Uh, are you working with a group that um, is all there for the same purpose or same reason? Everything you do in this program could tie in around that. That's true of Tai Chi. That's true of ballroom dancing, um, that you can tie it into what you're doing um, and be uh, very creative with it. And, and I certainly would encourage anybody, you know, go to agelessgrace.com if you're interested in that. Um, the training is fun, like I said. Um, and if you're interested in Tai Chi, our website is taichisystem.com. And we do have live workshops, but we also have training online. Um, we, we're really um, trying to utilize the technology that we have right now, but um, it, it's important to know that you can learn Tai Chi. It's not something that's so out there that is so hard. It's open the door has simplified it. We have made it accessible to everyone because we do want it to be for the everyday person. We want it to be out in your community. You know, we want it to be part of this whole exercise puzzle. You know, Ageless Grace and Tai Chi and dancing. I mean, think what a rich environment that would be for someone that for their brain and for their body. So all of these pieces are part of the puzzle and, and that's part of why um, I wanted to have you on, Denise, is to you know, make that be possible to uh, let everybody know how good this is, not only for their brain, of course it's, this was the three best exercises for training your brain, but it is for the body as well and it's really for that community of helping people be the best they can be at any age, right? Absolutely, yes. And and there may be people listening who are thinking, well, I don't want to become a ballroom dance teacher. That could take the rest of my life. But for example, NIA, which is a structured dance movement program, it, in, it incorporates martial arts and it incorporates uh, healing arts as well as dance. But it's NIA, N-I-A, now, N-I-A, N-O-W dot com. Uh, and you could learn how to be a NIA instructor, for example. Uh, yes. But all of these things, that what's important to get out of this, I think, today is that this uh, idea of being fully attentive and present in the moment, mm -hmm. which we call mindfulness, is very key to actually involving your brain and what it is you're doing physically. And that the physical aspect of it is critical to actually changing and improving uh, the brain or preventing cognitive decline. One thing we didn't mention is that people, a lot of people say to me, well, I'll do this when I'm older. I'll do this when I need to work on my brain. Well, again, I like to compare it to brushing your teeth. I mean, most of us wouldn't wait to start brushing our teeth when we found out we had 20 cavities. Right. Uh, we were doing something preventative and proactive. And so Ageless Grace is for children and 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds. I always say, who's it for? Anyone who has a brain. And that's true of Tai Chi. You could be any age to do that. It's true of dancing that has steps. Uh, you know, if your child uh, is interested in taking hip hop, oh yeah, get them to do it because they're gonna be stimulating their brain as they figure out how to do those steps, and how to follow the music and how to coordinate their brain and body to help them be able to do that. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Denise, and, and telling us all about it, letting us participate. Um, I know that agelessgrace.com, there's more information about that um, program tai chi system.com is for the tai chi system we do have uh, some free videos if you go to tai chi system.com you can learn a few more movements you got to learn a few here but if you want to learn a few more movements of tai chi we do have a video that gives you three good movements of tai chi and even how to teach it as well if you're interested in becoming certified um, i do want to um, 
thank everybody for coming on today. It was great participation. And uh, thank you again, Denise. I, I appreciate your friendship so much. And I appreciate your energy and your, your willingness to help people, especially with their brain training. So I just want to say thank you. And um, I, I will see everybody. We will have um, our next webinar is at the end of February. And we're going to have Danny Dreyer, the author of Chi Running, on. And he's also from North Carolina. So this is a North Carolina. By the way, Danny's a good friend of mine. And his wife and I have known each other since we were in our 20s. <laughs> oh, excellent. OK, so there you go. So I, I highly recommend it. Yes, go <laughs> listen to uh, Danny Dreyer. <laughs> I, I have this connection <laughs> yes. and, and yes, please know that you will, um, we will give you a replay if you were, um, had to get off of this or if you just wanted to watch it again, we will send out a replay. So thank you very much for coming today. I hope you all have a great rest of your evening. See you uh -huh. later. <laughs>